Okay, folks, it is 515. And as you have already heard, some of you are here. Uh, Jordan Rapp is my guest today. I don't know Jordan very well, but we've met via Twitter, where a lot of sports science geeks and athletes and coaches kind of are in my little world and I'm in their world. And luckily, it, it sounds like I think we're going to finish this, our guest series that you have listened to with a highlight because Jordan is so deeply embedded in your world of gaming and also my world of sport from before of, of, of endurance sport from before. So it's a happy intersection. So with that, Jordan, you can tell a little bit more about yourself. You Princeton engineer, rower, turned triathlete, uh, developer, game developer, and so forth. So lots of, lots of hooks to place you on here. Uh, take it away. Okay, so I'll here I'll share because I have a I have a presentation I put together for all of you. So um, yeah, I think ideally, right? It's interesting. I think that there isn't so much difference between the world of gaming, right, and the world of sports. And I hopefully we'll get into that, right? So sports are just a skill, um, and so we can talk about what that means. Um, so first, who am I? Um, I have been. Uh, elite endurance athlete for over 20 years as a, in college i was a national level collegiate rower um, at princeton university a lightweight um, and then transitioned to triathlon and was a professional for 13 years uh six-time ironman champion and the 2011 itu long distance world champion uh, and then since retiring in 2017 uh, i compete as a master's cyclist uh, placed top 10 at the Dirty Kanza 200 mile uh, U.S. National Masters Pursuit Champion, uh, bronze and silver medal at the UCI Masters World Championships, also in the pursuit, and then uh, gold medal in the team pursuit uh, at the Masters level. Uh, my background Can is. Can I just in ask McKinney. how old are you now, Jordan? 42. 42. Yeah, 42. All right. Yep. Uh, I have a bachelor's in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton, and I am actually currently uh, enrolled, uh, fitting uh, digital class, uh, online classes. I'm getting my master's uh, in computer science from Georgia Tech, um, and I'll finish this summer uh, also in an online program. So I love, yeah, I think it's amazing. You know, a lot of downsides, obviously, to COVID, but I think the rise of, and sort of acceptance of online education as sort of, uh, a meaningful and great way to learn is awesome. Um, and I, in addition to all the racing I did, I worked as an engineering consultant and field test uh, engineer for uh, Zipsram Cork. So it's a family, like a bike products family. And then also for specialized bicycles, Diamondback bicycles, and then and more. Uh, and I now uh, work uh, as a technical designer, software engineer at Respawn Entertainment on Apex Legends, but uh, have been there for two years. And then prior to that, I worked at Zwift, uh, in the same sort of roles uh, for three years. Um, so let's talk about sports and skill and why there really isn't too much difference between uh, games, uh, well, certain kinds of games, um, you know, and sports, right? So when I think of skill, I think of uh, basically that it's, it's a proxy for neuromuscular coordination, right? So cycling uh, is clearly, I think, right? We think of as a sport, uh, also a skill, right? Like by candling, you know, uh, the training, all of that. And then I think an interesting one, and I had a, my summer job for six years was I fixed uh, vintage and historic race cars and I got to us. So I actually have still a bunch of connections with a racing community. Um, driving a race car is, is most definitely a sport. Uh, and we can, we'll talk a little bit about more, but I would say, even though it sh was shown for a while on ESPN, like I don't think of poker uh, or chess uh, as a sport because I don't see the same sort of muscular, right? It's all thinking. It's obviously a skill, right? But it's not sort of a skill for our, like for our purposes here, right? So the muscular component is essential. And so by handling, you know, a steering wheel, mouse and keyboard controller, gamepad, joystick, right? You're talking about like fighting games, things like that. They all require, you know, uh, coordination and are highly specialized skills, right? Like train through many, 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 many hours of repetition. And endurance is clearly still relevant, right? Like I think you definitely have the idea. And I'm not saying that professional gamers are the pinnacle of health. And yet, you know, Apex Legends tournaments, you know, other major gaming tournaments can be six, eight, you know, plus hours. Uh, and so 
it's again very focused endurance right like hand and wrist type of stuff um but i think yours they definitely the big esports teams have started to recognize most of these guys they all have you know dietitians you know strength conditioning coaches um because it's overuse injuries right in the hand and wrist are massive and so i think posture overall health like they playing a game for 10 to 12 hours a day, which a lot of these guys do is it's definitely not easy, right? It's a weird to think of a endurance, but it's right. It's specialized endurance. Right. And I think sort of going back to Zwift and indoor racing, right. Riding a trainer removes certain skill components of cycling, but it adds others. Sprinting right. on a trainer is not the same as sprinting on the road, but sprinting on the track is also not the same as sprinting on the road and sprinting on a BMX bike with, you know, a tiny, tiny, you know, chain size, right. You know, at massive RPMs is also not the same. Right. So I think specialization of skill is obviously a thing. And I think people will gravitate to movement and skill patterns that suit their specific style. Right. That's true that the best Zwift racers are not necessarily the best road racers. And then the best players in apex legends are not necessarily the best you know, Warzone players or Fortnite players. Like, right. obviously, if you have skill in a certain thing, like a good bike rider is a good bike rider, a good FPS player is a good FPS player. But the specific, as you get higher and higher, right, like up the pyramid and into more and more elite level, it becomes, uh, specialization becomes even more important, right? And Which sort of gets into the importance of specificity, right? Like racing a bike is good practice for racing on Zwift. But racing on Zwift is the best practice for racing on Zwift, right? You know, it's deliberate practice and you need to know, right? And I think that's where we get into, you think of Zwift, right? You have to know, there's a draft, right? There's physics, but you can't feel them, but you learn to understand them through other cues, right? And I think that's where, like, again, you can see that time on the specific platform is is massively critical. Uh, interesting sort of side note on that is that you can often find sort of opportunities with other uh, to sort of make use of that specificity in other ways. So I actually, there's a bunch of race car drivers that are quite active um, in the endurance sports community that I know through triathlon. Um, and I used to write a column that was sort of similar to this talk for Lava Magazine for, oh, I guess about five or six years, um, sort of finding this neat intersection between technology and sports. Um, and one of the ones I I talked with a a very high level you know NASCAR you know driver named Landon Castle, and so when he watches footage of races, uh, you know whether it's himself driving or other people, he will often do it on on Zwift because he said, if I watch the whole race, like it's useful. But if I watch the whole race in a sort of state that I'm, it's very similar to what is I how I feel when I am driving the car, it's much more useful. Right. So he says, you know, I asked him, right. So for typically for say a four ish hour race, like a 500 mile uh, NASCAR race, you know, which is like three to four hours, he would say my heart rate is typically about 160 plus beats a minute, um, which is pretty high. Right. And he's losing, you know, over a liter an hour uh, of fluid, you know, and so right. basically he will ride his bike in a, at a similar level so that when he watches the footage, right it makes it more real, right? It's it's much more of what it's like when he's actually driving, which makes it, you know, I think you all, if you have experience, right, that sort of the tunnel vision, right, like closing in, it makes it much more applicable. Um, and so I think there's interesting where you find sometimes specificity in unexpected ways. Um, well, I, I, I got to, let me just, you know, it's there's lots of things you're saying that are kind of interesting to throw, yeah. to add on to, but you know, like there is research on the brain that shows that if a, if I, for example, am watching a sport that I have some familiarity with, there's some parallel processing going on where when they do movements, the same parts of my brain that would be controlling those movements will get activated. So I'm in a sense kind of mirroring uh, their movements in my own brain as I watch. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so I trained for a long time as a triathlete. Uh, one of my closest friends and long time. I don't I was probably more his training partner than vice versa was Simon Whitfield, the 2000 Olympic gold medalist, 2008 silver medalist. And 
I remember sort of some, we both came across some of this research and I think for swimming, especially like we were big believers in watching good swimmers because for most triathletes, you know, I would say swimming is probably the thing that comes right. They're good cyclists and good runners, sort of similar physiology, right. And then they become good enough swimmers. I mean, there's some exceptions. Right. It's um, just technologic. It's just a different movement. There's no right. crossover. Right. Yeah. And so I remember we both like, I especially did not have a ton of swimming back. I, you know, I watched a ton of video footage and even when I was a rower, like my coach same would just gave me a bunch of video of, of rowers and just said like, just watch these. Right. And I think that's one YouTube makes it amazing. Now, like when I was rowing, it's like so early days of internet, right? Like, you know, I had some, I have some like footage, right. And it's captured at like 320 P or something like that. It's like this tiny blurry. And now, right. You can, you know, you can get super slow-mo and like right, incredible right. footage, just hours and hours and hours. But I remember um, watching just, you know, Michael Phelps just swimming on loop, right. Because it was like for, to try and get some of that like just absorb a little bit by osmosis. Um, right, right, right. And yeah, well, I think the parallel. Another issue it, is you, you mentioned this, this, I guess there's general in Norway, we have this model of sports where we, we really want young children to uh, sample, to do different sports, to build a kind of a motor coordination uh, library in a sense, or build out their skill and then specialize late. So it's kind of yes. a late specialization model. Keep them, keep them sampling, doing different sports, multiple sports for quite a few years. And then at some point, you know, teenage 15, 14, 15 or 16, they start zeroing in on the sport that they're best at. But they have this motor, you know, skill set that is easy to then start to specialize. And it sounds like gaming has some of the same. You have the, the general abilities that you build where a gamer from one game can pretty quickly be at least decent in another game very fast just because they have this general gaming ability and then the and then the specialized skill sets build on top of that so it seems like also there esports and sports are very similar in that kind of model is that is that reasonable oh totally i think one of the things that's most interesting uh, is and we could we'll talk about it a bit more um Right is players who play a game at a very high level. Um, who, like Apex, we have you can play either with a mouse and keyboard, or you can play with a controller, um, whether you're playing on console or not. Um, right. So these are very different input methods, and yet there's definitely a perception among the community that because of the way that we've tuned the game, that currently, at the elite level, players who play on controller have an advantage. Uh, and so you have some very, very high level, like some of the best in the world, mouse and keyboard players who have decided that controller is an advantageous, right? Like it would be sort of analogous to the cycling world. If you had sort of people that were like, okay, I'm very, very good at time trialing, but you know, time trialing is sort of not relevant, but you know, breakaway sort of breakaways are now really a big thing in the Peloton. And so time trialing and breakaways are kind of like, they're similar, but like obviously very different. And so you're sort of like, okay, I'm going to become a breakaway specialist. And so you have some of these players that were mouse and keyboard players that have decided, okay, like I'm going to become a controller player. And you would think like, that's a totally different. And yet they operate at an extraordinarily high level. And then there's sort of this very slight dip. And then they're basically back at almost the exact same level with this totally different input. And you think like, I've been playing on a controller my whole life and yet it doesn't matter at all that uh like i played controller like it's not like oh well you're, he you're has not 20 getting years the advantages of, they are yeah, yeah yeah like he has but 20 years of keyboard experience and like a month of controller experience but because he has so much more gaming experience he's clearly better than right. i am and it almost doesn't matter right and i think it's you can see that all of the other skills, right? The general skill bucket is so big that the specific skill then becomes essentially the difference in the specific skills. It's like, 
it doesn't make any difference because all of the other skills support that specific skill and already allow you to leap off at a very high level. I think, right. you know, I saw that with, with triathlon, right? Like when I started racing triathlon, the fact that I had been an elite rower, it was like, oh, like this is basically the same thing, right? It's like, there's not really, because I have the, like, I have this huge general yeah, skill. Racing, of, a racing skill set. You know, there's right, some like chat, have, there's chat going on, so you got to check the chat out because yeah. these guys are. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk way more about aim assist and controller players because I think okay. it's it's one of the things that's most interesting from this, right? And it's, so we're um, and sort of starting to tease in there, right, with like the idea that equipment makes the man, and but vice versa, right? And so you have like machine specific physiology, and I think this is something that I saw at Zwift that, and I, you know, where we talked a lot about like you need to normalize the trainer for obvious reasons, right? That like measuring devices, which is what a trainer is, they're not, you know, they're not accurate enough to be precise. So everybody needs to ride the same trainer and sort of all those trainers need to be calibrated in the same way. But nevertheless, riders will, certain riders will perform better on certain trainers. And we saw this, that certain riders who are very, very good riding on a, like a, uh, Tax Neo, uh, or actually Tax is probably sorry, riding on a Wahoo Kicker, were much less good on a Tax Neo. Uh, the Tax Neo is the most sort of quote unquote realistic. Um, but the, the there's an interesting question of whether like realistic meaning similar to on the road, but yet it's not clear that that necessarily makes for the best racing. Um, is that because so, I have a oh, Tax Neo bike, the full, you know, the. Yeah is that disadvantage in me or yes or, yeah yes oh i'm so yeah, glad yeah, because you're saying it. it's the most accurate and realistic to on the road but it's interesting because it's not clear that right like if someone is is and so the way that i would say right is we had this when we were doing evaluation that there were people who could they could make their trainer report that they were generating 1500 watts and yet they were almost certainly not generating 1500 actual watts like if you were talking like on a real ergometer but the question then became did that matter because they weren't cheating but hmm. they had basically figured out how to game the system and like of course that's part of gaming right it's like figuring out like which so like in apex right certain characters are overpowered in Zwift, certain trainers are overpowered, right? And so it becomes this thing of like, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? Like, do you want to encourage that? And I think it, it, sport has always, I think, struggled with this. And they sort of have this uneasy relationship, right? Where, you know, with cycling, where they, you have the Project 96, where they had all these super aerodynamic bikes, and then they banned them all. Uh, and now they're sort of slowly allowing more and more of that technology. The rubber suits in the pool were super interesting. Um, and the I think sharp, the rubber suits were especially... Sharp yeah, suit. because they exposed that there were certain people that benefited more, right? So there was a German swimmer named Paul Biederman. Um, in 2008, he was ninth in the world uh, in the 200 and 21st in the world in the 400 free, right? 21st in the world in the 400 free. And then in 2009, in a rubber suit, right? Because that was the year of the rubber suits. 2008, 2009 was the jump. He won the 400 free world, uh, world championships, right? And he set a broke Ian Thorpe's world record, right? So you have a guy who was 21st in the world, breaking the world record of the arguably along with like probably, you know, Thorpe was like the best, like middle distance freestyler of yeah. all time, better than Phelps, right? You know, and he shaves, he goes, his PR in 2008 was 347, right? And then he goes seven seconds faster in 2009. Right. And then they banned the rubber suits and Biederman sort of fell off the map. And again, you could say like, oh, and people criticized him, which I thought was ridiculous because it's like it's not it's not his fault that FINA made these decisions. But it was for whatever reason, his physiology, he benefited more from the rubber suits than other swimmers did. Right. Um, and the, and, and the I think you're starting it turns out the, the, the shark suit, the, the thought was that it was the external surface that was changing the water interaction with the skin and it was given an advantage but the, the in retrospect they found out that what was actually happening was it was compressing 
the body and it was improving flotation. So they were sitting yep. higher it's all in buoyancy. the water. All buoyancy. So the whole idea of the shark skin engineering and all that stuff was bullshit. It was the yep. buoyancy. <laughs> it, to- it was uh, right. You know, it was like when they did the first the Tesla. Uh, yeah. Um, right. Like it was when they did the first sub two and they all the nutrition and the shoes and everything like that. And then like, I think if you did the math, it was like 95% of the, the actual like gain that Kipchoge had came from the aerodynamics of basically the Tesla and all of those pacers. Right. So like they talked about all this stuff, but it was basically an exercise in aerodynamics. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, but shoes, the super shoes are also very interesting because I think, they've made a, a massive impact in the marathon, but I think the sport where they've made an even bigger impact is in triathlon. Like you've seen, you know, so typical triathlon sort of marathon time was like, like for an elite male was like, we'll say it's about two fifty, Right. And you could see like the super shoes came out and it just dropped like five to six minutes, like two forty four is the new two fifty, Right. And so you think on a relative basis compared with regular marathoning, like it's way more, but, it makes sense because the the cushioning and that response for a race that's eight hours where sort of just pure fatigue and muscle soreness is much more of a limiter, yeah. right? The shoes are going to make a bigger difference, right? And so I think it's interesting how you see that the technology ends up, you know, certain athletes will benefit more, right? Like I would bet that heavier athletes, right? Your triathletes are going to benefit more from lighter athletes because again, like there's right. more actual shock. They're less specialized. Well, if you move your conversation, these issues over into the gaming world, are there mechanical like innovations in the controller units that are making the same kind of changes that are somehow allowing for the, the talents of the athlete to, to express themselves more? Is, is that happening? Yeah. yeah. yeah so the arguably, you know, I would say pretty convincingly, the best player in Apex in the world right now is an Australian uh, uh, guy named uh, Jen Burton, right? That's a gamer tag, right? Uh, and so he has two controllers uh, that he comes with, right? And so we have a very detailed inspection process, right? Like to make sure that people aren't aren't cheating. You know, that there's nothing in there, like, because obviously with electronics, you know, you can actually, you can make it so the controller actually makes you better, but, you know, we're not, so we're checking for those, but his controllers all have a very, very slight drift. Um, he has one controller that has a slight lateral drift, and he has one controller that has a slight vertical drift. Um, and the reason it, that we, our theory anyway, is that in our game, aim assist only kicks in when we detect an input. Right. Some games like are passive, like whether you're like you could just have your hands off the controller and it will track for Apex. You must provide some input. Um, But what the drift does is that even if you're not actually providing input, the controller is seen as an input. Okay, it is. And so it will cause aim assist to always kick in. Right. And so this gets into interesting, like, should that be allowed? And it's like, well, he's he's clearly not cheating. Right. Because there's nothing. Like the, you could argue the other way, right? The drift is problematic because he basically has to manage it. But he certainly is taking advantage of what the game provides to him. So right? he In is a unique very way. cognizant of that drift that, and, and what effect it has for him. Yeah, although I, it's interesting you use the word cognizant because I don't know. I don't know if he's aware, like what level is he aware at, right? Like. Because it's obviously the game is so fast that there's no like thought process, right? But I think it's more that it's he's a he's cognizant at some level for sure, right? Because he perceives well, he's at least cognizant that he hasn't chosen to buy a, a controller that doesn't have the drift, right? Or th- more that he's basically he probably has he buys lots of controllers and is looking for basically specific drift, uh, uh, a okay. certain amount of drift, right? Or that you know he plays with a controller until it gets that drift and then he plays with it until then the drift becomes too much and then he throws it away and gets a new one uh, it's like shoes then so they're literally wearing this stuff out or there's a there's oh, a yeah. sweet there's a sweet spot for how it performs and then they get rid of it because it no longer performs adequately Is that yeah correct? and mouse and keyboard even the specificity of of the mouse itself Right, like how sensitive your mouse is or not, the switches on your keyboard, right? Like how much you actually have to depress them before yeah, yeah. you get 
response. All of these things right, are very individual and players will hunt down certain behaviors, right? And they will have things that they want. And, you know, you see some players with split keyboards, right? Where they want their left and their right hand angled differently and the size of the keyboard, the keycaps themselves, right? You know, how they feel tactily, right? All of these things, there's very, very clear individualization, right? Where players, the best, a, a given player's best setup is clearly not the same as another player's. Well, I can tell right? you then, are in the world of these students now because they are chatting it up on these different details. <laughs> so, so uh, you, you're, I, I, I'm pretty sure they can confirm, but I think you're our guest lecturer that is most into, you know, and, and knowledgeable of their world. So I think they, oh, uh, they're giving you some props there just through the oh, chat of, of oh, what oh, uh, different uh, comments on what you're saying. Very good. <laughs> you know, so thumbs up. So you're you're in their world, man. <laughs> yeah. In a way that yeah, I, mean, I cannot be. So anyway. I don't I mean, but see, it's interesting. I think, you know, this is where I think, right, when we talk about the next Olympic sports, right? I think almost everybody says that at some point video games will be in the Olympics, right? And I think Zwift. Zwift is a very comfortable sort of first step for a lot of like the IOC uh, and like UCI, right? There's a UCI yeah, eSports yeah. World Championship. Um, but it's interesting because it's very much like it started out being very much like this is cycling on the road, but in a virtual world. Gamified a little bit. Yeah. And so, but there was an interesting thing, right? Where, and so this is right that it's over indexed right now on pure physiology, right? Like the skill aspect of Zwift is not yet there. Um, but because well, there's no coming, steering, right? although right. there is an experimental steering thing, but it's not an yeah. advantage. Yeah. But, but you, but you definitely see the draft, right? So like I know from the data that the best Zwift riders will for a similar performance, will put out, 20 to 25 percent less power for a similar result than inexperienced swift riders because they know how to feel the draft in the absence of physical like feedback like wind in your face right because right, they actually right, right. they ride so much and it's and i think you know the the timing and use of power-ups i think this was a big thing with the uci was will you they keep the power-ups in the game for esports, right? Because it's like that's not cycling, but it's 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 very much Zwift, and uh, yeah. and they kept them, and I think it was great. And like one of the things that I'm most proud of my contributions is that um, I introduced and and basically did the development on the, the sort of the last couple new power ups. Like I came right, and they had the existing power ups, which was the Aero Boost, the the Feather, which reduces your weight. Um, uh, and then there were some others, but then I reprogrammed, they had a, what's called the burrito, um, which was basically like, was made of you undraftable, but initially it basically only affected riders behind you. And so if like you and I were riding next to each other and I enabled the burrito, it made me undraftable, but it didn't really matter because they were just drafting you. And so I made it under the hood change that it basically basically broke drafting within an area of effect uh and then okay. basically we yeah. made it reintroduce made that to racing and then the a, other a one was the ghost power up a better power yeah, yeah. Up. that was yeah. the ghost power up that made riders go invisible um and it was interesting because it got panned really hard when i like when we first roll it people were like that's gonna be totally irrelevant and then you saw people that actually figured out how to use it in useful ways and there yeah. were some races that were actually decided based on clever use of the ghost power up and i think zwift's biggest opportunity is to basically become more of its own discipline right that it's like zwift racing is not sim it's not a simulation right it is not road racing in a virtual world um it's and i think in order to become an engaging like cycling discipline and specifically like you know swift i know has goals of and and i think the uci has goals of esports being on yes and you can the 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 neat thing about the ghost was you were draftable and you could draft but no one could see you um for 10 seconds so i think isn't it like 10 or 15 10 yeah 10 seconds, 10 uh, seconds. but like again right you could talk about and we'll talk more about sort of tuning i think 
you know, making it so that these things are all more tunable, like how strong they are, how long they last, all of that stuff. I think that's another thing that Zwift has not done much, like where we talked a little bit of it early on, right, about with Apex, you always want certain characters to be better, but you want that to be ever changing, right? And I think with Zwift, the there hasn't been a, yet enough sort of rotation within the power-ups of making certain things, like, I mean, certainly the arrow power-up was way too strong when I first started, and one of the first changes I made was to have the um, the undraftable power-up. Uh, there's no drafting for anyone within a five-meter radius, um, so it's really it's meant for solo guys that want to make a breakaway, right? Because it's giving they you perceive. just a, yeah, it's giving you a few seconds to try to break away. Yeah, because the for those who don't cycle, the effect of the draft, particularly in in Zwift, is very powerful so it is really hard to break away in zwift compared to i would say on the road would you agree although it's it's interesting and i think one of the the other sort of less obvious contribution that i made was that all in, in the when i started all of zwift's physics were hard-coded and so they were always the same and one of the first projects that i led was there are now they are parameterized so in every race the physics can be different um to basically enable certain behavior. And so we did a lot of experimentation and the physics that you race on in Zwift is probably, is almost certainly different than what the world championships gets raced on. But like, I mm -hmm. think that, that those physics should be changed much more often than they are, because I think that's something like in apex, right? We're constantly tuning. And I think basically we know that you cannot find balance you don't actually want to find balance basically you want to find an imbalance that is still fair but is engaging and then you want to change that imbalance to something else but i think zwift is sort of on the hunt for like bal they want to find balance and then keep it right and i'm like no, no no that's not that's not the way that you make games right the way that you make games is that you're sort of you're they're always broken they're just broken in different ways but, but, and it's fine but, yeah. but i gotta ask you jordan because is is the psychology of the endurance athlete who's very process oriented wants predictability in the way things work you know you know what i mean i, I always found there's a certain mentality that's a generalizable mentality to endurance athletes that's very process oriented and we don't like surprises um but is that the same, you know what I'm saying? Do they want that, what you're asking for in the gaming world or do they want it to reproduce? No, no. I mean, people, I mean, in the gaming world, people for sure want it, but I also think people want it in the cycling world, right? Like I think you see, this is why the Tour de France route changes every year, why the world championships venue changes every year. And it, maybe it's in part also why like track cycling is, I think is, which is super exciting has in some ways maybe floundered more than it should because there isn't enough variety um i think that's where you're starting to see like things with the champions uh league that they're trying to basically they're trying to say okay this part of track cycling is predictable but here let's show you all the ways in which it's unpredictable with a lot of these overlays and sort of the data stuff well and what's happened so with I think, track cycling it's like a tournament that they've compressed the time dramatically yes. so that now you know, it's just a much better viewer experience and it's more fatiguing for the athletes. So it's, there's more unpredictability about how they recover, uh, right. you know? And so anyway, so I think the champions league is quite interesting in track cycling, but uh, I think, it's, yeah, it's like more like what you're, you know, a six hour, uh, gaming experience, you know, it is, but I think that speaks to the fact that endurance athletes, I think want consistency and fairness, but I don't think they want they don't want sameness, right? And I think this is like, mm. I, I like what Herman said, right? It's an imbalanced balance. Y yes, right? Like that's what that's what we're after, right? And I think that's where Zwift has the most opportunity as a platform to grow. Um, you know, that was a lot of what I, what I tried to work on was basically giving them more tools to basically make an imbalanced balance, right? Um, What's the current membership of Zwift? Do you have any idea? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's well over a million, you know, they're private companies, so they don't share. And like, I don't like to ask now that I don't work there because it's like, you know, right. But it's, but, so how would that compare with say apex legends in terms of, yeah. So, I mean, apex is substantially bigger, right? Like, I think we are like 
50 ish million users, active users, and well over 100 million registered players and stuff like wow. that. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, I mean, here's yeah. a good segue, right? I think, you know, when we had our recent, you know, tournament, uh, the ALGS championships, which is our, is a $2 million prize purse. Uh, and we had over 600,000 like viewers on Twitch, which is basically like, you know, which is the dominant, you know, platform right now. Wow. Um, and so this is going to brings us back to, Right, the controller discussion. Right, you know, controller has aim assist, but but sports rules have always favored and promoted certain play patterns. Right, like, um, and I think you see like the NBA is a great example here. Right, and so I have a, you know, you can see over time from 1998 to 2018 percentage of field goals by zone. Right, and so like they move the three point line backwards. Right, and yet three point shot percentage still went up. Right, because basically teams recruited better three-point shooters, right? Like, and essentially teams made the calculus that it's higher risk, of course, to take a three-point shot, but you get 50% more points, right? And so like, that's a really good payoff. And so I think teams basically just did the math and were like, we'll just, we'll just rec basically. And so the game itself has become biased towards three-point shooting. It'd be interesting to see whether or not the NBA sort of makes decisions to like, try and bring it back down right or do people like that um but i think you know for all of the complaints around sort of oh yeah controller right like that sort of implies that there is like a rightness and a wrongness um mm -hmm. and i think it's clearly not right it's like what does the what a game what does the game decide right and so the nba i think consciously or unconsciously right like has made the decision that like they will set up a structure for the game that will reward three-point shooting. Um, you know, now it's, some of it may have been intentional and some of it may have been unintentional. I think that sport, like big sporting leagues are often less intentional than game because game design is a very clear discipline. It's like, I don't know that in, like in sports, I think it's more reactionary, right? Like I don't think the NBA sort of set, sets out and says like, oh, we want to have we want an increase or a decrease, right? Like I think they're sort of like we want more three point shooting, or we want closer games, or games that are further I, apart. I right? I think I cycling. Always, I, I compare sports with a Darwin. It's a Darwinistic environment. You know, I'm you know into evolutionary theory and so forth. And and I right. if I watch a track and field competition, I can just look at the athlete and with about at least 80, 85 percent accuracy, I can tell exactly what event they do just by looking at them. You yes, because there is such a Darwinian kind of effect on if it's a high jumper they're going to have these more this morphology if it's a sprinter it's going to look like this and da 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 and so uh i think that is what is also you if any rules change any kind of thing will fairly rapidly just filter through the entire population of performers and start tweaking what what bubbles out of it you know and, and like yeah, in no, rowing in, in in rowing back in the when was it 80 I think 84, the women up until 84. Or so the women were racing a thousand meters instead of 2000 meters. Right. And that's a, a three and a half of a minute up goes up to six minutes, you know, in that range. Well, that was enough to completely change the morphology of the athletes. They, the women, you know, they were, they were bringing in these former power athletes and putting them in the, in the row, in the boat. And then they became endurance athletes, pure endurance athletes. Yeah. You know, so so these tweaks, and that's a big tweak, but little tweaks yeah, yeah, still, I mean, that's a... still have a have effects on any population of performers. You know, changing the rules of the game will change who, you know, the all kinds of characteristics of the. No, athlete. I mean, I think backstroke was one of the most interesting, right? Like before they put the. Once swimmers discovered that going underwater was faster than going above the water, yeah. and then before <laughs> FINA put in the fifteen meter rule the best backstroker was the person who could hold their breath the longest. Right. right? And they right. talked about having the submarine wars where essentially like the hundred backstroke was like, you ended up basically taking two or three strokes, right. Where yeah. they would go almost the whole length of the pool underwater, take a couple strokes, flip, and then go almost the whole length of the pool underwater. And Fina was like, well, this isn't backstroke. And it's like, well, this is, this, this is, is what you did. They're the just solving the problem, the way, whatever problem you gave them. Yeah. yeah and so I think you can see that in game it's traditional video games right like there is that is a much more like sort of known quantity like oh yeah we're going to do this and it will 
potentially do this, but there's also going to be a bunch of unknown effects. Whereas I think sports is much more like, well, we should change this for this reason. I think, you know, and the, the knock on effects, I think, are less clear, right? It's more of a bureaucratic process. And I think there aren't enough sort of game designers working in traditional sports, um, which is why I think esports is really such an exciting field because you have this, you have all of these people sort of thinking about game systems. And now you're merging that with sort of the spectacle and the, you know, excitement. Yeah, so they have right? the game theory understanding more Yeah, right, than which the, is what, you know, yeah. the term for in gaming is what we call it a meta, right? You know, where certain characters are meta, right? And then, you know, you have different weapons, right? And then certain weapons are meta, right? And then the combination of maps and weapons and legends. Right. And then in Apex, it's a team game. Right. So the like composition of like of three different legends together. Right. And the fact that each of those legends must be unique. Right. Like obviously in Apex, if we were to say, OK, you could pick any characters and you could even pick three of the same characters that would be have massively different effects than you right, have to. What's right. the best composition of three different characters? Right. right. And then the maps change it. But this is this, this sort of interplay. Right. Where it's like, OK. This is what we're going for. And it's interesting, like when you talk with map designers, right? Of, okay, this is what I wanted. This is why the map is this way. And then when you actually put it in the hands of pro players, right? And then how they're like, they are so good and they figure out all of these things so fast because, I mean, in part because of the, the both because of how much they have played and then how much they do play, right? You know, they're playing 10, 12 hours a day. They just figure things out where you thought, like, I had no idea that that was a thing. I had no idea you could do that. And I think, you know, it's interesting. The controller thing is a, is a big one, right? Where this is a, a sort of unofficial top top 25 uh, ranking of the current players uh, in Apex. And the ones with dots are all on controller, right? And so this is this argument that, like, you know, controller is too strong. But some of it, of course, is like, I think is self-perpetuating that, like, controller certainly is stronger in certain play styles and then if people believe it's stronger then you'll have more people playing that way yeah i guess so then, what, what percentage of all players are using controllers because that's going to impact the, the, the yeah daily. i mean it's it's maybe less applicable only because like you have on consoles like if you play on a playstation you play on an xbox you must play on a controller and so it's not a uh, it's not you don't have choice on every platform um, and so that skews it. Yeah. Right. And so it, it ends up becoming a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so right. you could say like players play on controller because they think it's stronger, which then makes the game basically be played the way that controller players prefer to play it, which is controller is clearly more advantageous in close quarters and less advantageous at long distance because it's less precise right so it's it favors movement over precision and so cl like close quarters versus far distance and so you think like is controller overpowered or is it just that players believe controller is overpowered so they play a controller style which then of course favors controller because more fights end up happening in the way that controller players prefer to take engagements well, all yeah. right, let me, you just made me think of something. Well, we need to take a break, but we're flying here. The time is flying. It's already been an hour, but I think everybody's having a good time listening. Um, normally we take a quick break at, at the top of the hour. Um, but I would, but I had this one question now. Let's see if I remember what my question was. <laughs> I think I forgot it. So uh, guys, do you want to take a break for five, 10 minutes? It's six o'clock now. Uh, or do you guys want to roll on and finish early? Any feedback on that? Because this may be kind of a conversation that you, yeah, toilet yeah, break people... would be appreciated. Let's yeah. do that. Bio biology break, uh, and we'll come back in in uh, you're you're back at like in ten minutes, okay? And then we'll try to finish early. I'll take silence as as uh, agreement. Yeah, All right. This is fun, Jordan. I lots I'm learning a lot and I think they they understand that you know the game or you know you the world you're working in. So uh, that's cool. Yeah, I would it, never have expected to sort of end up where I did. But I mean, I I played games, you know, my like I was a gamer before I was an athlete, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then 
I think, you know, I played a lot of video games growing up. Um, I just, I, yeah, I just it always. Yeah, you're, a, you're enough younger than me that probably you were in a different set. Of, you know, I was so old that the games that I played in my youth were two dimensional. There were no. Yeah, I mean, mine know. too, right? Like, I mean, uh, you know, Super Mario. And other. Yeah. So uh, to Otar, I work at Respawn. I've worked there for two years uh, on, on Apex for that whole time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and but I mean, it's, is it's Apex, interesting. Is it a new player in the market, relatively speaking? or? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, yes and no. I think, you know, you compare it to something like Call of Duty, um, which has been around, you know, for much longer, or League of Legends. I mean, League is maybe diff not a great example because League is not a first-person shooter. But say compared to Call of Duty, which is a first-person shooter, or Overwatch, um, Overwatch and Call of Duty are probably the more established ones, maybe along with Battlefield. But Apex now, right? I mean, we're going into our fourth year, so it's hard to think that we're like we're a new game. But I think if you know, if you look like over the historical arc of first-person shooters compared with like it's still you know, Counter Strike bit... or you know Call of Duty. Right. Mia, Mia you so say fun. you've played Nintendo as if that's going to make you connect to me, but see, I'm even before that or or Super Mario. I did play, I did buy a Nintendo. But I was playing Space Invaders and Pac Man. <laughs> I mean, I that my first I had an Atari, right? That was my first, you know. Like, yeah, Atari. That's what I mean. I had like, an Atari. I had an like, Atari. You know, like single, like a joystick and like one input button playing, like yeah. you know, a little bit more than Pong. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I remember I was, when I got I was so into... good at Space Invaders, you know, because it, it it was just once you learned it, it there was no. I mean, it, it was just a. a pattern that you just figured out i mean i don't know how many hundred screens i could go through before i just gave up i was just yeah. tired i was exhausted yeah. you know yeah that, those early games that's what it was was just once you figured out the patterns you know it then became just an endurance competition you know? yeah no i mean it's i think <laughs> i mean it's interesting like i certainly grew up in the era of like you play against the computer right and i I still much prefer that. I think it's interesting, right, to work on a on a first person shooter, right, a game that is that is humans versus humans. Because I don't love like it, the ga ga playing against another person is always hard, right? And I think it's nice. One of the things that I like about gaming is that you can often like sort of like you can turn your brain off a bit and relax, right? Like you can put you can make you know game you can set it on hard mode or whatever, right? And different games have different sort of ways of tuning that that sometimes you know it's like stupid and sometimes it's quite good but i do i do prefer playing against the computer more than playing against other people because other people are always like other people are very smart um you know whether they're <laughs> sort of you know intellectually smart or just like game sort it doesn't matter but it's always hard right and so i do i don't love the i think the games industry i i hope you know like you still see great sort of player you know pv what we call pve right or like you know ai games right i think you know god of war and that type of stuff but um it is it's interesting right that the this is sort of the current like what is engaging to people right is now uh and i certainly think if you're talking about esports like nobody really wants to watch player versus computer right i think certainly esports wouldn't have happened without the sort of oh. rise of but 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 one thing about zwift today. that's different than and, and it does play to our worst uh <laughs> human features is you know it's also a training platform yes you, you know it's it has group rides and so you can just solo work out you know it's yep. so it it has that traditional training component to it however the, the problem with Zwift or the challenge with Zwift is our own egos in that we join group rides, which are supposed to be, you know, that I well, my goal today is to keep my lactate low, my heart rate's here, and I'm going to do this for three hours, and it's going to be, you know, 
and that is very difficult to achieve in Zwift because of this. You, you, you want, you tend to want, if someone cycles past you, you tend to want to jump on their wheel and it, and slowly you get this, this acceleration process that happens. So I don't know, gaming, uh, you, the gaming, uh, electronic gaming doesn't maybe have that because you don't have the, tr there's no such thing as just training, is there, or you know uh, what I mean? Yeah, I mean, in a certain extent, no, which is, a, I mean, although I think games are looking for ways to bring that about, right? And so I think you think of something like like Apex or you imagine a game like Call of Duty is maybe a better example, right? Because it, it has an actual campaign mode where you can sort of, you can play and the movement is all the same and the weapons are all the same, but you're playing against, right, like the computer. So is that... But, so the question is like, is that training or not? Because like that gets to the point of that we're talking about specificity, right? Like, is that actually the same? Uh, I mean, it's interesting that you say that they, there isn't the question of balance for casuals versus professionals. I think there is. We just don't really think about it. Like, why is a and like why is a basketball basket ten feet? Like, that's clearly like it's clearly better for probably most people if it was like eight feet. But we just sort of have accepted that, like, oh, like regular people just play on the same court. Like courts are bas – a basketball court is this size and the baskets are this height. But it's basically like it's sort of geared very much towards the professional game, um, you know, uh, rather than – or you could say that maybe the professional game is basically bound by the limits of what we have decided is a sort of acceptable at, like, college or – High but I think also it is. there is some just a motor performance aspect of it is that if you change the rules of something tremendously, then it then it's one issue. But if you just change it a little, like if you just sink the goal down a few centimeters or you make some adjustment based on height, it actually is a much more challenging motor adaptation when you because then you get interference problems. So if you have yeah, I mean, if, it's, you, if you have yeah. athletes that are used to a certain height, and then you switch, you change it just a little, you'll just blow them apart in terms of their, um, because they're so used to a certain thing. So I think that's part of the reason that standardization has just maintained. All, it's all... interesting where you do see, you do see departures though, right? So like, there's a couple of interesting examples. One is gearing on junior bikes, right? Uh, is UCI minimize sets of maximum gear size so that kids can't race on gears that are too big which of course then changes the dynamic of racing because you can't sort of just power away because you're capped a little bit uh and so i think that's an interesting one where like youth the cycling has sort of changed things on the youth side but the one of the things that i think is the most interesting example of changing is that high school and college football american football yeah play with the same size ball but the nfl the ball is bigger uh i mean and noticeably so and yet you there isn't sort of much talk about like whether or not like a player like oh will they have issue like catching an nfl ball or will a quarterback i, I didn't have... know i didn't even know the ball was bigger yeah, uh, yeah. that's interesting well, in, in, so, in, so in soccer, which with the World Cup starting, we do know there's ball size differences, male, female, junior versus senior, you know, so there is, they yeah. do use that as, as to try to uh, respond to growth in, in that. Uh, so there are, but I think that gets into your motor pattern thing, right? Like, is yeah, it, yeah. is a ball that is proportional to the athlete better or is it better that you always have the same ball so that you then basically know how a ball of that size reacts, responds, right? And I think this is well, where you, I get. I would I would suspect your adaptation would be smoother. Whereas these kids that every time they change age group, when the ball changes, then they've got to go through a an adaptive process. Whereas if they were all always using the same ball, they would it'd be a more smooth function. Yeah, because... I mean baseball, right? I think. Yeah. Baseballs are always the same a size. Baseball is a baseball, right? So, so I, there's different ways of solving the problem or, or trying yeah. to solve it. In rowing, you know, you, you, I get, I rowed when they were just switching from the making blade to the hatchet, and you know the the transition to the different. Yeah. And and one of the things that happened was back injuries. Yes. Because oh yeah. I mean, hatchets way more load on a hatchet, load, right? I mean, a hatchet. 
junior rowers or at least young, very young, they, they're not allowed to use the hatchets in a lot of countries. So they, they, they try to limit that as a protective measure. So they have, yeah, I mean, water polo, certain... right. I mean, ball size. So I, I mean, it's interesting because I think, I think there's way sports. It's just less obvious, right? Because I think in gaming, like we talk about all of this stuff because, and in large part, right, because it's so dynamic and literally the change, it is like you change lines of code, right? Like it's much easier to basically change the size of a virtual ball than it is to be like, okay, all water polo balls, right? All soccer balls all over the world are now, you know, half a right, centimeter right, smaller right. in diameter, right? Like that's a, you know, that's millions of dollars, right? Yeah. To change. So that's that's a think, good point. Is gaming, you can just play, you can tweak things constant. It's a constant experiment uh, to see. I guess you can see results in in days or weeks in the data, in the metadata, how it's how some small changes impact. Yeah, and of course you also have not only can you make the changes faster, it's much easier to instrument to basically gather data on those changes, right? So you you can respond and react. Yeah, I mean it's true, right? If you if you you know you can certainly break your own game if you make uh, you know too big a change, right? Which you see. Right. Um, Interesting. So that's fascinating. It's just such a, a one an interesting experimental arena for all those of us who are scientists. We're thinking, oh, this would be fun to be in control of of a world, and, and then, you know, just make small tweaks and then measure the effect of it. You know, so yeah. all right. Well, is everybody back? Is I I don't know if I see ever. I can't tell if people are actually back, but uh, I think we'll just kind of start rolling again. All right. I, so, I mean, I think it's. It we yeah, have a good back. segue because I think uh, sort of on that data, right? I think the the Champions League in track is a great example of like starting to sort of do a lot of esports type things, but in an existing sport, right? Like, how do you make track cycling? How do you change track cycling without without changing track cycling, right? And I think it's you start to look at things like how do you make the data part of the game, right? And I think you certainly saw like, again, maybe positive or at least sort of neutral effects of COVID, right? Was that sort of this type of engagement of, you know, sort of streaming and like this instant feedback and a lot of the data being a part of the game, you know, really came about, right? So you can see the, yeah, I mean, Twitch essentially doubled in size uh, overnight uh, because of COVID, right? And like has just kept growing. Right. right? And you Zwift, know, now you see it was it was good for Zwift, I'm sure. To, to oh, yeah, it. massive. I mean, there certainly is fall off now, but I think it's clear video games and the idea of spectating video games. It's a little bit like getting a degree online, right? Like the idea that you would spectate a video game is totally normal now in the same way that oh yeah like you getting a degree online like total i think totally normal um right, right. right you know yeah. you're starting to see right like high school collegiate esports programs are coming out right you know it can be you know lucrative you know and i think it certainly has changed the way that even regular sports right like they think i think you saw some of like you i don't know if you remember when they had like the nf uh the nhl where they had like the puck that had like the like streak on it this oh yeah yeah, like, yeah yeah that and was, it was terrible yeah. it was a right? failed was experiment awful. but they tried well the yeah. lasting in in the nfl we have a lasting effect and that is the the yard to gain marker the first down marker it, yes. We're so used to it that we assume the athletes are seeing that same yellow line on the field, but of course they're not. You know? Right. And so <laughs> but, I think that certainly that right. Like in that way, Twitch has changed not only esports, but like, I think it's changed the way that people think about spectating sports. Right. And I think <laughs> the changes that you see in the champions league and track cycling probably don't happen without that ecosystem sort of, just exploding over the past yeah, couple of years because I think data as an integral part of the spectating experience is like that's just an expectation now, right? Like players players want that and then viewers want that, right? And I think it's you know, baseball was always great with this. Like I used to be a big I'm a big I never really played baseball, but I love baseball because it's such a data rich sport. And I always, when I, my favorite way to 
sort of spectate baseball was on the radio because when you don't have anything to see, you have the announcers, they have to fill the time, right? And they filled it with basically like statistics, right? And and data. And now, of course, that's all visual, right? And so I think all of this, uh, yeah, Herman, the streak on the puck was crazy, right? So basically the NHL decided that like they would do like a, like a vapor trail on the puck. And so the faster it went, the like brighter the streak was. And it was the idea was that you could people on TV could see the puck and it was like, I don't know that that was ever actually a problem. And yeah, it was like people hated it because it was, it was very messy and not very well done. Um, I think probably now like CGI is so much better that they could. No, it was in real time. It was not post-production. It was in real time. Yeah, no, it was, it was not good, but I think it could be better. And I certainly think people learned a lot from that. Right. And I think now you see, you know, sort of learning from Twitch. Right. And I think one of the big things that we uh, respawn did in partnership for the ALGS was actually partnered with Twitch to basically do this thing called multi-view where you could watch four different screens yourself on Twitch at once, which was crazy. Right. So you had four, you could watch, you know, like the main broadcast and you could follow all your own individual teams. But I think, there's this, it is this virtuous cycle, right? Where people are watching and then the way that people want to watch then ends up changing the game itself, right? And I think that's that's another thing that is, I think it would be interesting to see how sort of the esports influence on traditional sports, you know, how that continues to grow because I think that's, it's certainly we haven't seen end. And I think sort of as a last kind of talking point, right? I think, we should talk about cheating because esports, but right, hackers and cheaters can totally ruin a game. And I think because the consequences are so high, the video game industry, and like I was, so when I was racing, I was the athlete liaison for Iron Man to WADA. Um, and so I would say the difference in seeing how seriously video games take cheating versus how seriously I would perceive the sporting world takes cheating is, is dramatically different, right? Like I think, but a big part of this is because of how obvious it is, right? Like video game hackers are obviously cheating, right? Like they have perfect aim. And so what happens is, is they undermine sort of the spectacle of the game, right? Well, like they and totally how do they do it. that? How do they cheat? What's the, what's I that? mean, there's way more ways to cheat when it's just bits and bytes, right? I mean, there's there's aim bots that will basically use like machine learning to actually like center your crosshairs and stuff like that for you. You can actually edit uh-huh. values in memory. You can send bad data. Like, I mean, there's the ways, <laughs> I mean, the okay. ways in which you can but cheat. But you need to have legion. programming, coding skills and so, so forth, I guess. Oh yeah. I mean, but, or you, I mean, in many cases, though, it's just, you just buy it, right? Like you just, there's, there's online marketplaces to buy cheats, just right? Like the same way there's online. steroids. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so, but, you know, traditional anti-doping, even when it was lax, right. Isn't as obviously ineffective, right? Like even you look at somebody like Bjarne Reese, right. You know, hematocrit of 60 plus. It's not like, it's not like he wasn't riding a bike, right? Like he was still had to ride a bike. It was still hard. He still lost sometimes. And so yeah, yeah. humans are still human, even if they're on drugs. Whereas like sort of humans in video games that are cheating, like they're no longer recognizable. It's, it's as obvious. Players. You see it very clearly. Okay. Yeah. And so the consequences are so much higher, but I think you're starting well, what, to what see... happens if they get detected do they get banned from the game or how's that work? yeah i mean it's an ongoing battle right and i think it's the trying to detect them faster and faster and faster and then trying to prevent them but you know it's like yeah there's so much for this right and it's a huge it's a huge industry on both sides right like we have a whole dedicated team like we basically have our own sort of like internal usada wada right and then there's sort of this whole like right. Balco on the other side selling the drugs and all that and it's this escalating battle back and forth but i think what's interesting especially from a physiology standpoint is like how they start to come back in and so one of the projects that i led at swift was basically the formation like bringing back as an official arm what was called zada which was the the zwift analysis and data accuracy team um like i was the internal lead for that team and it was basically how you detect people cheating in zwift um and there was a lot of work around sort of pattern recognition and sort of, you know, physiological buckets, right? Like, are you depleting your like W prime, 
and then sprinting at a level that should be impossible based on what your W prime value should be at, like right. critical power. Right. But it's interesting to see that, like, right, because in video games, the data is the performance and vice versa. And so, but this is more true now in regular sports as well because of like instrumentation and so like there's the uci really really wants pro teams power data and the pro teams really really don't want to give that data to the uci right. because you think you could be so much more informed in your like targeting of who you think is cheating because you know the performances that are outliers even within a field of outliers um and so I think that's yeah, interesting, right? I, and, then, and I'm a guy who has used some of that a lot on Twitter. So, and, and there's only a few athletes left in the peloton that are still able. One of the greatest cyclists around is a guy named Mathieu van der Poel from the Netherlands. Yes. And, and he's still, when he if, if when he does well, you know, he'll put out a full uh, uh, FIT file of his data with heart rate, power for classic races and i've gone in and done the analysis but a lot of the riders they've even told me that their team will not let them they used yeah, to no. put stuff out but their team has banned them from uh although matthew out. vanderpool is interesting right like i think you see though the limitation of the data like i think it was he he when he won the last amstel gold and they did a power analysis and it was so clearly obvious from that amstel gold file versus his previous win at amstel gold that the power meter was miscalibrated Right. Like he ended up doing something like, you know, 380 watts for like normalized power for like six hours. And you were like, no. Right. Like a rider who is that good doesn't become like even in a span of several years, like doesn't become 10 percent better. Right. Like his 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 peak, like two hour power was something like 15 percent better than the previous time that he won Amstel Gold. And I remember reading an analysis of his power file and it was all like, this is incredible. And I'm like, it's not actually right. It's just clearly bad data. Right. right. Um, like it's just he didn't zero offset it. And so I think you see some of the flaws in that as well is that you have to be able to recognize bad data as bad data and not as evidence of cheating because it's like if that power file of Vanderpool's was real, like he was so like, like it was essentially inhuman, right? Because you're like, oh yeah, this guy who was already one of the best cyclists in the world in the span of like two years basically improved an absurd amount. And right. like, you can't look at that and think like, if that's good data, he's obviously cheating. And I think, but then you actually like the, the, of course, then you have aerodynamic data where you could say, well, you can tell the data is garbage and that you can basically feel good that he's maybe not cheating because if he's putting out that much power to go that speed, his aerodynamics are awful. And yet we know that that's also yeah. not the and, case. And Strava does these weird things. If they don't have the actual power data, it'll make estimates that are just ridiculously stupid. And, and so, it, you know. <laughs> Because it doesn't take into account the pellet that they're in a peloton. Oh yeah, no, I mean there's a lot of that, right? There's and, all I mean, it's funny with e-bikes to see like you know I've lost some KOMs right to some guy, you know where the Strava estimated like oh yeah that guy did 900 watts for five minutes and I was like yeah. really? <laughs> right. Do you do you really think that he did that? <laughs> right? Like um, you know, but then yeah. I think it's interesting sort of on the that type of cheating, you know, and then you talk about like motors, which is sort of like very like electronics coming in, right? Like motors and bikes, but then you right. have sort of traditional doping in video games as well right like adhd and stimulant medication right like a lot of that is clear and so it's like yeah you have like digital doping digital anti-cheating right and like all of this yeah it's like i mean people we for sure had people that we suspected of cheating on zwift and our suspect the way that we thought they were cheating was that they were riding an e-bike on the trainer because it would right, be almost right. impossible to detect right and that's where you start to get into things like patterned recognition and all of that i mean yeah like it's interesting like you talk about like hiring people that make cheats um like well yes we, we got to jump on this we're currently writing a paper on stimulants in esports yeah uh, that must be for monica and nutrition uh but i but that reminds me of some data from years ago where they gave military uh soldiers who did these these obstacle courses they gave them amphetamine in, a, in an experimental study and yeah. what you then what might expect is the the stimulant helps them perform better but what they ended up doing was they performed worse but they thought they performed better 
So yeah, were, I mean, it's there is certainly wild, the question they were of hyped some... up, but their actual physical performance was worse because they were making mistakes and so forth. So it's not always that a stimulant has the desired effect. No, certainly not, right? But I think you know, cheating is there's a lot of it is you know mental, like you believe it, and in some cases, right? It's do, does it help because you believe that it helps? I mean, I think you know, military has certainly, I think it came has come out right that you know doping, you know, stimulant uh, amphetamine doping is massively rampant among U.S. special forces, like in the Navy SEALs, because it's so grueling and especially sleep deprivation, right? right. That they take these things and does it actually help, right? And then it's like, well, it helps, right? Like the sort of the placebo effect. It at least real. keeps them awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's probably a good way to stay alive. So, yeah. So, I mean, and yeah, we could enter into that conversation is that in something, in some businesses or, or situations like space flight or firefighting or soldiers, maybe I'm going to say, Hey, I don't mind if you dope, if that keeps you alive and keeps me yeah, safe, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I think, it's, you know, but I think this, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how, you know, cheating is, is a huge problem in any sport. Right. But I think it'd be interesting to see the way that sort of some of the practices from video games and esports, like, do they make their way into sort of more traditional sports where you start right. to use data as a way of sort of identifying cheaters in a different data that's different from sort of the like, oh, you failed the drug test, right? Well, it is. There have been some papers on where they've tried to look at performances using statistical approaches, yeah. like you're talking about saying, what is the probability that that improvement would happen with this athlete given their trajectory of performance in the past? So there is some of that kind of work being done but you know actually being able to take it to a court and say yeah we know exactly. they cheated they they can't do it and so yeah. anyway but but i i think we've had a, a wild and good discussion of these intersections between esport and sport um what i was thinking is if there are questions very specific questions from the listeners from the students why don't we do a quick Q and A, and and it would be kind of nice if you'd actually use your own voice and just just turn on your mic and ask your question to to Jordan. And yeah, or him, the chat. I mean, whatever is whatever. If, you're yeah, if you don't is. want to, but you're welcome to actually speak. <laughs> yeah. Got to think of the million dollar question. So yeah, so give yourself, but but it can be a fifty thousand dollar question. It doesn't have to be a million dollar question. So we are waiting with bated breath for what, for a question. Uh, Otar has raised his hand. Go for it, Otar. Yeah. Uh, so we've seen a rise in anti-cheats becoming more and more valuable uh, in gaming. Uh, such as in Valorant, where they have uh, the anti-cheats placed in the innermost kernel on the PC. Effectively... Yeah. Uh, being able to mine every single piece of information on your computer, uh, turning it into a safety risk if abused. What's your thoughts on like how far they have to go morally and like legally to combat the cheaters? At yeah, that I mean, point? I think that I forget the name of the Valorant one, but you know, it does, right? It has it's, Colonel uh, Vanguard. Access, it has Vanguard. So to, the thing with Vanguard, right, is that it's not actually as effective as I think it should be, given right the level of sort of intrusiveness that corresponds to it. And I think that's sort of similar, like with like kind of traditional anti-doping. And I think to me, I don't think you necessarily need kernel access, but you are right that sort of the value. I think you know, their Roblox just acquired this company Bifron that makes a yeah. software called Hyperion, um, which basically encrypts the binary itself, right? So you end up doing a lot of work to sort of change where it registers. And I think certainly as cheats themselves become more valuable, right? Like anti-cheat software becomes more and more IP. And yet I think you also see that there is sort of a shared community here, right? Like the, the core of Apex is anti-cheat is easy anti-cheat, which is made by Epic, you know, which is Fortnite. Right. And for them, right, it's sort of it's like it is a business, of course, but I think it's also 
they could choose not to share it, right? They could choose to say that we're going to use easy anti-cheat and only make it available in Fortnite so that Fortnite itself is a safer game because that will be good. But I think Epic made what I think which is the correct decision, which is that it's better that the commu like the gaming community has access to good anti-cheat software than that we alone have it. And I think like Roblox has sort of taken the opposite approach with acquiring Bifron and saying that like Hyperion is no longer going to be supported for customers, right? Like it's only for Roblox. Um, and I think the more that you can sort of take a collective approach to cheating in video games is bad for the industry, the better off you'll be. Um, but I, you know, I think it's hard because at the same time, it's like the most effective anti-cheat is going to be specific to your game because you will know the vectors for cheating, right? And then you will know like how players can abuse them or not. And so I think, you know, in some cases it's obvious, but I think in other cases it's sort of less, but I think for sure the biggest area of growth is less of, is sort of going more in the way of like physiology of saying like the bio passport, right? Where you like saying like statistical right. probability, machine learning of saying like, it is literally impossible that this person would hit, you know, 10 headshots in a row, right? Like right. that's or just reaction not... time, things like that. There are certain, there's limitations to how quickly yeah. you can get a signal yeah. from your so brain I think... to your muscle and things like that. Yeah. So. so I think it's, I think it's sort of, you. It's the, it'll go in opposite directions. I think for esports, I think anti-cheat detection will become more grounded in the fact that the games are physical as well as sort of mental whatever right that there's there are very clear physical limiters on esports and i think in traditional sports it will go more towards the esports style of saying there are very clear statistical and data indicators that a performance should not be trusted that are separate from like oh you failed a blood test right like i think it's too bad that the bio passport got weakened because i think the bio passport was the right step in that direction of saying like we didn't catch you for this but like over historical trends we can see that your data is bad and i yeah. think that and, was and the for right those direction. who don't know bio passport we're talking blood you can you can you can get some data on blood characteristics and even though right. you don't detect the doping you can detect the effects of the doping on the blood and so anyways. right which is which is how most video game right it's like we don't detect the cheating we detect the out the the sort of the byproduct of the cheating right, right. so i think hopefully esports grabs more of the wada model of physiological and hopefully wada starts to grab more of the esports model of looking at the data so, well it's a, you're predicting a kind of a, a mind meld here between these worlds that have each you know they're bringing something to the table and and Zwift, which was the original topic of this particular little discussion, which I happen to have 1,500 hours in game. So that makes me fairly decent as a gamer in Zwift, I guess. Uh, but but Zwift is kind of at that intersection. Yeah, I mean, this was this was really, I think, the the longest legacy that I have at Zwift, you know, past is was really basically bringing and sort of leading at the time that I was there, the the anti-cheat effort, right? Which was entirely based around this intersection of data and physiology, right? And so there were people that we banned for performances that were physiologically not sort of trustworthy, but then also people that we banned because the data was not trustworthy, right? Like they, they would sprint and their power would flatline, right? right like they would right. and generate the same power yeah. and it's impossible, right? And so right. I think- there's well, Simon yeah. has a question, so I'm gonna yeah, perfect. Kick in, Simon. Uh, thanks. I asked the question earlier in the chat, but I'm not sure if you noticed it, so okay. I'm gonna ask again. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about bringing in people who actually design and make cheats themselves to help you fight cheaters? I mean, yes, yes, and also no, right? I think. There is a little bit of the story like that, you know, if you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, where the FBI ends up hiring the check forger because he knows all this stuff. But I think the difference and the reason that we maybe don't do it more is that it is not that we don't know how players are cheating, right? It's not that 
that we don't know the, the weaknesses. And so from that standpoint, I think it's not uh, it's not an absence of knowledge. It's more that right the games are millions and millions of lines of code and like you know the, the average I think you know sort of if you look at sort of historical computer science right it's typically like well written software is like a, one defect per sort of you know about you know, a couple thousand lines of code, right? So you just think the number of opportunities for exploit. And I think there's also then the question, right? Like getting into what players will tolerate in terms of invasiveness. I think, you know, Valor, when when Riot introduced Vanguard, right? They said basically, in order to prevent cheating on in Valorant, you must give us basically the lowest level of system access to your computer where we could basically like break your whole computer so that you could play the game. Right. And players were understandably reticent about that. And so I think there's not more of an effort, I think, to reach out to hackers because it's not that they are, it's not that there is an absence of skill, right? It's not that they are remarkably gifted programmers who just see these things that like other people don't see. It's like they're in many ways like quite unsophisticated. And so it's sort of like, it would be like, how often do, banks hire someone who basically just robs a bank right and it's not that it's not that these people are necessarily super clever it's more that they're just like they're clearly like quite immoral um right like robbing <laughs> and, a bank with a and gun high risk is, high risk takers yeah. yeah yeah right and so i think you imagine even just the value of like the source code as well right like if someone is willing to sort of profit off undermining the integrity of the game, like how confident are we really that they're not going to just like steal like Apex's source code and just put it on the internet, you know, um, or basically just use their job to figure out how, how to make even more cheats. So, I mean, this isn't to say that we have, we have engaged. It's very common to, to hire players who have made mods and sometimes you could look at those mods as being cheats, but I think the difference between what sort of the modder community, right, which is I'm going to change the game because I want the game to be more fun or different or better is very different than like, I want to change the game or break the game so that basically people can cheat, right? There is, so there certainly is a strong appetite to hire people that are interested in basically tweaking the game, even if it's in ways that maybe we don't like quote unquote want but less of an appetite to hire people who are really focused around sort of exploits. You want innovation, but with a certain degree of a moral framework. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think of somebody like a Graham O'Brien, right. Who in cycling yeah. world, like was, he certainly pushed the envelope on what was allowed under the rules. And you, you know, I think he did a lot of things that the UCI didn't like, but he never. And so you could say he was like, he was flexing the rules but not sort of clearly breaking them. And I think, you know, this they, is one of the And the rules super... were very unclear back then. Yes. They were not, the, the framework was loose. And so he- And was... I think this is one of the things that's maybe most disappointing about like the Team Sky thing, right? Where they, they sort of talked about all these marginal gains, right? And then at the end of it, like the parliamentary inquiry was like, oh, but you guys are actually all on corticosteroids, right? Like, yeah. so like all of this talk of like, you know, sort of special beds and everyone has a blender because they do these recovery shakes. And it's like, oh, but you're also on drugs that have been abused for the past like 30 plus years in the program. Well, I think on. I would almost give them credit for doing a very uh, uh, a smart kind of hand trick where they're saying, look over here on my right hand of all yes. these, of all these uh, <laughs> marginal gains. Well, on the left hand, actually... I'm right. doing some fairly straightforward things that are illegal or yeah. on the, at least on the edge. Plus I'm yeah. paying millions of dollars, which is, that's not a marginal gain. That's just right. stacking the deck, you know? Yeah. So no, anyway. but I mean, I think there is, you know, it's certainly, I think you can, you, you know, maybe there, there's always an opportunity, I think, to learn from the way that people are exploiting. Right. And I think, you know, you saw, like with Balco or some of these labs, like should there should WADA have engaged more with like the way you know somebody like that? Like I don't know, and I mean even you could say that you know we at Apex right were wrong for not engaging more with the cheaters because we might they might give us access to you know they we might have flaws that we don't sort of realize, and I think that's right. a tough you know I think that's a there's no clear right it's a moral calculus at that point of like. Do you want to hire somebody who 
you don't necessarily agree with their morals for right. the greater good. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, Jordan. There's, there's no a good right question answer. here. Uh, Katie, Katie asked, or Katrina asked, do you have any numbers on boys versus girl players? How many boys and how many girl gamers? Is it a big difference? So, I mean, I we have numbers, rough numbers for Apex, right? Like, you know, it's, you know, you can look at the, and then there's the gaming industry. I would say, interesting, right? Like the biggest growth over the pandemic was in female gamers. Um, like Amazon has more data, you know, people like joining Twitch, right? And like people, you know, EA has more, um, but for sure, I mean, like, I could tell you like in the, in the pro league, right. There were, it was 120 players and it was 120 men, men, boys, you know, whatever you want to right? Like, right. so, which I found, you know, quite, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's disappointing. Now, certainly first person shooters as a genre seem to appeal more to, you know, you know boys, men, but like apex as a game, like diversity is super important to us, right? Like I think we're basically 50, 50 in terms of legends, male to female we you know the narrative arc is a strong part of the apex game right and there you know there's transgender characters there's non-binary characters right there are you know uh lgbt right like that is a big part of you know gibraltar is a gay is a gay man right bangalore is a gay woman right like these we want to have characters that are real and yet it is certainly disappointing, right? That the diversity of the play of the characters in the game is so much higher than the diversity of our player base. But I mean, part of the reason that we push on diversity in the game is to hopefully, you know, sort of change that because like, I mean, video games as an industry is basically like, has traditionally been young men, right? And we're trying very hard to make it sort of more inclusive. And I think Certainly, over the pandemic, you the rise uh, among the in the gaming community of female gamers was dramatically more. It was sort of like boys and men already knew that like playing video games uh, was like a reasonable way to connect with people without sort of without when you could be go really social. <laughs> yeah, but are, but I think, are you know, there are there games or? gaming game like esport ish type activities that where there is an overweight of females are there any genres any specific kinds of these esports activities where the 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 pendulum has swung the other direction i there may be i i could not give you an informed answer there um right. my intuition says probably not um you know but i think but it's you know i think Zwift certainly has did a, has done a very good job, right? From the outset, there was basically equal coverage, uh, equal prize money um, That's true. for yeah. men and women. Um, but there in terms is not of, equal participation on Zwift. No, no, no. It's I mean, it's it's it is certainly you know very skewed, heavily male. Um, yeah. But I think again, you know, Zwift is a big believer in. I mean, Zwift is the title sponsor, you know, of the Tour de France, uh, the Women's yeah. Tour de France. Yep. You know, brought that back. So I think video games, there the accessibility barrier isn't there, but there's still is certainly a cultural barrier, right? Like, you know, you know, we have a lot of active chat monitoring and that type of thing that, you know, like there's a lot of toxicity when like people behind keyboards are just not very nice, right? And so right. I think when they're that's not a super a welcoming keyboard. environment. Right. So, yeah. you know, I think, and I mean, say with, you know, Twitch's own numbers, right? I think there's basically among the top hundred most subscribed channels of individual Twitch broadcasters, right? There is currently, there is one female um, because there were two, but one of them decided to take a break. So now there's one, right? I mean, which is, which is not great, right? And I think even you see there is a lot of sort of hmm. quasi exploitation, you know, right? The you know hot tub streams that the female streamers are popular because they are sort of traditionally attractive, right? And they leverage right, that right, right. more than it. because they are very good at games, right? Uh, so. Well, it's my guilty pleasure is I watch a lot of mixed martial arts or in UFC in particular, the United or uh, Unlimited Fighting, whatever it's called, championship. 
uh, and even there, there are quite good and 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 uh, female commentators. So it's, yeah, you're you're even behind the most kind of traditionally male thing there is, which is beating the crap. Well, out I of mean, the the Apex, <laughs> the broadcast team for Apex is basically fifty fifty. Okay, it's just the player base. Right. I mean, I think, you know, from that standpoint, I would say not behind the UFC, right, in terms of who's paying, you know, to watch Ronda Rousey versus Conor McGregor. Right. Like, I think yeah. almost every sport is still still a laggard in terms of participation yeah. um, and engagement. Right. Like, you know, Ronda Rousey never get, is, has, you know, there has no been equivalent of the Conor McGregor sort of Floyd Mayweather. Right. You know, there's nobody getting you know, top, t- top earners. I mean, the Williams sisters were remarkable. Right. But I think, you know, even as much as Serena Williams made, I think in her career, they said, you know, I think twice as much as second most, which was her sister Venus. Right. Like, and then they're that much higher than everyone else. Like even they pale in comparison with like a Cristiano Ronaldo type of, right, you know, right, there's right. no billion dollar female athlete yet. Um, Rose. Yeah. Rose. No, Yunus, she's, she is quite popular. Uh, yeah. Although she's kind of had a, a layoff right now. Well, guys, this has been good. I don't, is there, or let's say one more question and then we'll call it a night. Uh, it's been fun. Any last question for Kate? Yeah, Katrina, Kat, Katie, go. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the report system in Apex because. As a female player, you get you hear a lot of shit, and that can kill like your motivation to play the oh, games. Yeah. And you have the report button, but you never know how seriously the company takes the reports. So, like, how many times do you have to report a guy for telling you to show you show him your tits through the whole game before he gets banned? I mean, so I will say that, you know, every report get goes through, gets, I mean, it's not like, oh, we just throw them away. I mean, certainly the frequency of reports, right? Like there's all kinds of algorithms to detect. But again, there's certain, like there's keywords and all of that stuff where, you know, like you report someone and then the system looks at what they said. And then there's certain things that like trigger a more aggressive response than others. I mean, I think it's very hard because you imagine like the volume is just massive. There's, there's literally no way that you could have like an actual person read every report. And so any automated system is going to have flaws. Um, you know, and I think it's like, we had a discussion uh, about this, like where there were some players from, uh, they were uh, a group of players from Mexico and they received a ban because they were talking on, they basically were pointing to a place on this, like basically saying, we're going to go here. And right. And then they use the word Negro or Negro, right. Black in Spanish. But like the game detected that they were using the word Negro as a slur. Right. And then, and so they said like, like we're just saying the color black, but like, yeah, how do you, it was just a but language. Of course then, it's a but of course we have tons issue. of, like we have players where, they will then give the report of like they are that word is then being used in a very derogatory fashion and like how does the system intelligently differentiate between those two right and you're always gonna you basically you go too far one way and then you sort of soften it and then you go too far the other way and i mean it's it's awful and i mean i would say that we try very hard to basically make it a good environment for players but we could certainly do more do better um you know and i think it's moderation is a massive challenge because it gets into sort of the the frontiers of like language analysis and you know sort of actual ai right of like this is someone being derogatory because it's 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 obvious when a person sees that that like oh yeah this person is clearly being derogatory and they should be banned but like how do you make sure that a human sees that when the volume of sort of material being generated for review is impossible i think this is a reckoning that the industry as a you know sort of the entire tech industry right like twitter facebook you know all of these things like yeah you know like everybody has this problem um 
Well, and, and we we have AI research at our university that is they're particularly good in language, and and, and even they, I mean, I, some of the work I do with professional cyclists, we're we're trying to look at text analysis. But the problem is, is that any given team, there's multiple languages that are being mixed into each other while they're communicating. You know, because you've got a a Norwegian cyclist that blends English and Norwegian in yeah. the same sentences. Right. And that's it's what very, happened with these players. Normal. In, yeah. And that's what happened with the players in Mexico, right? They were they mixed English and Spanish so that it was not obvious when they used the word negro that they were using right. it in yeah. so Spanish. Yeah. So it's a super tough challenge. Yeah, but for and, any I, kind and I think to, to Siemens' point, right? Like there are actual people at the end of this, and the depression is real. Like Facebook moderators, there has been actual, there is actual like study data out there that like the mental toll on Facebook moderators is massive, like that you hmm. can only do it for so long and that it's probably like, it is almost certainly going to permanently damage your psyche to some extent, like, because you just see and hear things. I mean, especially on Facebook, right. Where pictures and videos and things like that need to be yeah. moderated. I mean, you will see it, things that are unimaginable. Katrina, do you have your hand up again, or was it you just haven't taken your hand down? You have a new question? Nope, sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. Well, guys, it's been fun. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. I have learned tremendously about uh, gaming from you, <laughs> from and from the class. But this has been great, uh, and I and we've recorded this so people will, I'm sure, go back and listen again. Some or those who weren't able to do it. So thank you so much for joining us, Jordan. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, great this discussion is, of this intersection between sport and esport. Uh, and and the te and I think there was a lot of technology that was being discussed, even though it was kind of infused into the discussion in a subtle way. So yeah, fantastic job, great. You you are our last guest speaker uh, for the semester, and I think it was a it was a highlight. So great job, thanks again. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And you know, I was when I was still racing, I was uh, I actively followed uh, your research and. You know, I was a, always a, a fan. Um, you know, I still the the sort of the my favorite, and I've shared it countless times. Right, the sort of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but for sport, I think is one of the best sort of visual representations of like data oh, and good training. Like, I still I remember making that, and it was just in a moment of frustration. It was <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think well, sometimes right, that's you know, brilliant, brilliant comes out of that, but yeah, so I right. think it was for me to sort of come back, uh, and to you know, because sports is such a you know, traditional sports is such a big part of my life, right? And to sort of now be in this other side and to see these intersections, right? And to see, right, like I make video games, and yet what I did for most of my adult life is to me, I think it's still incredibly relevant, um, sure, even though yeah. on the surface it might not seem like it. No, I, I'm the same. I was super skeptical to teaching an eSport course because I thought, what it is a fall order like I do not know a thing about it. How can I possibly do anything? But but it's there actually, it there is there are connections. So I, I've enjoyed it. Anyway, all right, guys, uh, you have an assignment. Remember, December 1st, you've got the third assignment. So don't forget that. And uh, we'll let Jordan get on with his day. Yep, and then you have a request for the the that your your graph, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but sp for sport. Oh yeah, I'll show training. that. Yeah, it's for, actually for endurance training. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Great. Uh, it, okay, well, thanks so again. Thanks, have a great rest of your day, and uh, yeah, thanks for, so much for having me. Well, really, I'm gonna really I'm gonna try to get you back here next semester, next year at least, when they have yeah, when we teach anytime. Just All right, time. take care. Cheers. Bye. All right, guys, I'll put the link. I'll put some something out on the uh, hierarchy. The only thing I ever learned from Maslow. <laughs> and uh, but don't forget, you're, you've got an assignment on the first and then uh, it's due. And I know you'll do a good job. And then we, you've got your last exam uh, or your exam on the, uh, the 15th, as I recall. And so then uh, you'll be done. So I hope you enjoyed this. Good job. Take care.